this is in addition to our other buoyancy video where we go through some of the theoretical physics and the results of your lab experiments to create an actual buoyancy equation. So from your experiment, it seems that the buoyant force depends on how much of an object is underwater and the fluid density that the object is submerged in. So let's see if we can use some physics to kind of back up these results. So here we're going to look at our friend Pikachu again. Um, we're going to look at two cases. We're going to really see how it doesn't really matter which case is, whether you're um, submerged, completely submerged in a liquid, or whether you're partially submerged in a liquid. This, our derivation should work fine for both of them. So let's say this is point A, and this is point B, and we'll do the same thing over here, or point A could be the top, and point B is the bottom. The main thing is that point A is the higher part, and point B is the lower part, and there's a difference of delta H between the two. Now, what we're going, what we can do is we're going to look at um, using our hydrostatic pressure equations. Look at the hydrostatic pressure at Pikachu in different points and see if um, we can translate that into some type of buoyant force. So again, if we look at the hydrostatic pressure at A. It's just going to be the atmospheric pressure. Or in, in our case down here, it's going to be the um, atmospheric pressure plus some added pressure going down there. So it could be that, or it could be atmospheric pressure plus rho g, let's call it ha, depth at h. Our pressure point b is going to be now our atmospheric pressure, and this is our front case, plus rho g delta h. Or if we look at point um, at our second version, it's going to be the atmospheric pressure plus rho g h a plus rho g h b, where h b is a total, or actually let's put this as rho g and delta h. And now what we want to do is we want to see the difference in pressure. So if we look at delta P in each of these cases, and we look back up here, well, in the first one, if we do PB minus PA, they both have PATM. That's going to go away. We're left just with rho G delta H. If we look at our second case, they both have atmospheric pressure. They both have rho G H at depth A, and the difference is just going to be rho g delta h so it really doesn't matter which version i use if i have it something partially submerged or fully submerged we get the same results that the difference in pressure from the surface or from the the, the top part of the liquid to the lower part of the liquid based on our little um thing here is just rho g delta h now we want in terms of a force so if we look at our friends and we say okay what forces are acting we know that there is a gravity force and we know that there is some upward buoyant force which is what we called it and we want to see the size of this, we can say, well, the buoyant force, we remember that if pressure is force per area, then force is going to be pressure times area. That the, um, the difference in kind of forces here is going to be equal to the difference in pressure times area, or it's going to be equal to rho g delta h times an area. And again, if we assume Pikachu is like a cylinder, like we did in our other cases, the area is just the area of the cylinder. And if we look at this, then if we kind of look at our cylinder here, well, delta H times A is just the volume of our cylinder. So we can say the difference in forces is going to be, now this is the difference in force between um, what's pushing on the top and what's pushing on the bottom of Pikachu. So we kind of have force top and force bottom. And we we're trying to find a difference in those forces. That's going to just going to be rho. I'm going to move the V to the middle because it's usually written that way. VG. Now we got to be, so, that's a nice result because that does jive with what we saw in our experiment that the force is proportional to the density. The force is also proportional to the volume. Now, if we look at our cases though, what does this volume really mean? Because we want, remember, we're trying to make a general case whether we full, we're fully submerged or partially submerged. Well, this is really the volume. So again, this difference in forces from top to bottom, that's what we call the buoyant force. Now, what this volume is really the volume that's underwater. So if we want to generalize it, this is going to be the density of the liquid, or technically, I guess it's fluid. I'll call it liquid for now. 
this is going to be the volume under water or under a fluid times G. And the reason we want the volume under the fluid, not the total volume of Pikachu, because in case two here, it is the total volume of Pikachu because all Pikachu is underwater. But in case one over here, that volume represents just this part, just the volume of Pikachu that's under the, that's under the water, under the fluid. And there's our equation for our buoyant force. And it's always equal to the density of the liquid, the volume under the liquid, the volume of your object that's actually submerged in the liquid times G. Now we do have a couple special cases though. Like, well, actually in summary, we can say that this, the buoyant force is due to our, is really due to a difference in hydrostatic pressure from the top to the bottom of our thing. Um, it's net upward force due to pressure on an object and a fluid. And again, we wrote it as we said, we can find this thing here. Just remember that volume underwater or volume below the surface is the volume below and the rest of it's the volume above. So we do have some special cases. So one case is when something is floating. Now, when something is floating, again, let's just draw a general free body diagram. We know something in a liquid, it's gonna have an upward buoyant force and it has a gravity force on it. Again, this is just something some generic thing floating in a liquid. Now, when you float, you're on the surface and it means that you're not accelerating up or down, that the buoyant force must be equal to the gravity force. Because if those are only two forces, they're balanced out, they gotta be equal to each other. Which means that the density of the liquid times the volume underwater times G must be equal to the density of the object times the total volume of the object times G. Because remember, this is just the mass of the object right there. And what we can what we can glean from this is, um, there's a G on both sides, so let's not worry about that. The volume underwater is less than the volume, the total volume of the object, because it's not fully, it's floating on the surface. It's not fully submerged. Well, if that's true, that means the density of the uh, of the the liquid must be greater than the density of the object. So for things to float, the density of the object floating must be less than the density of the liquid that it's floating in which again makes, makes sense. And also you can kind of look at this, the closer the densities are, let's put a little star over here. So the closer the densities are, the more it is underwater. And again, I tend to use underwater a lot. It means under fluid, it doesn't have to always be water or the greater percentage is under the fluid. Now, when something is fully submerged and floating, this is kind of like think of a submarine at a, that's moving along at a certain, at a constant level. Again, the buoyant force is still equal to the gravity force. But this time, the volume underwater actually equals the total volume of the object because it's fully submerged. And we can also say this is when your, the volume under is, goes to maximum. or goes to the vo the total volume of the object. So in this case, it means that if you're fully submerged and floating, like a submarine might be, that the density of the object must be equal to the density of the fluid. And again, submarines can do that by changing, they pump air and water in and out and stuff like that, and they can modify their average density of the whole thing and make it equal to the, the liquid that they're in, and they can float at a constant level. Now, our other case is when you're sinking, I'm going to add a slash, you could be rising as well. When you're sinking or rising, this means your buoyant force and your gravity force are not equal. So again, be careful with these things up here. These are only true when you're floating. If you're sinking or rising, your buoyant force and your gravity force are not equal. And if we go back to our Newton's law equation for this, the difference in forces is going to be the buoyant force up, gravity force down, that's going to equal m times a, and you could have some acceleration. You're going to accelerate up or you're going to accelerate down. Now we can kind of see pretty easily if our buoyant force is bigger than our gravity force, we accelerate up. If our gravity force is bigger than our buoyant force, we accelerate down. So you drop like a steel ball in the pool. Gravity force is going to be a lot bigger than the maximum buoyant force. It's going to accelerate down to the bottom of the pool. 
If you take a beach ball and push it underwater in a pool, well, the density of a beach ball is actually less than the density of water. So if you push it under, you actually are making the buoyant force greater than the weight of the ball. And if you let it go, it's going to accelerate up in the air and go shooting out the top. So again, you can use this to find out what the acceleration might be. But again, to sink, that's when the, the density of the object is greater than the density of the fluid. Um, if it rises, that's when the density of the object is going to be less than the density of the fluid. So again, buoyancy problems are really just force problems. They're just, we just have this new force called a buoyant force. We have a little equation for it. We have a couple different situations where it might show up. But besides that, it's really just another force problem.